as we've been praying, just to be before the Lord, this is what we're here to do, and uh, to be responding in our own way through the prayers. This is very important about our gathering together in any place where God's people meet, our own response to the Lord, and how we trust His initiative and His grace to speak to us. and. Even as I'm preaching now through this, uh, it's important that we are hearing the Lord speak. These are not just my words. I'm going to be looking at God's words and for us to be responding to the Lord in an attitude of worship. Um, this was something about responding to the Lord's word was well expressed by somebody who was called Gregory the Great. He was a bishop of Rome in the 400, 600s. I don't know if we should call people the Great. <laughs> There's no one great except the Lord. But he said these words which I think are great. To true servants, Gregory said, true servants always pay attention to the facial expressions of their masters so as to hear and follow out commands with promptness. So too, the righteous focus their minds on the presence of Almighty God and gaze upon His Scriptures as upon His countenance. So may we do that as we look at the Scriptures as the countenance of the Lord. Give us grace, we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Let us open to the book of Romans as we are now making our way relatively quickly to the end of this great letter, the book of Romans. And I'm going to read Romans chapter 15, verse 14 to 21. And that is up there. Thanks. Thank you, George. And I'm reading from the ESV. That might be a little bit different if you're using the Pew Bible. And... Uh, this starts the epilogue of the book of Romans. So let's hear what Paul has to say as he writes to the church of Rome in the, uh, in the 60s. He said, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and are able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And in Christ Jesus, then, I have found reason to be proud of my work, for I will not presume, says Paul, to speak on anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, to bring about the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build upon somebody else's foundation. But, rather, as it is written, those who have never been told of Him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. The words that I have brought to you are all about some of Paul's ministry. We're going to be looking at quite a personal part of Scripture about our great apostle, as the Gentiles, the Apostle Paul. And then next week, Louis will look at Paul's movements, and then we're going to look at Paul's prayer for his ministry and his movements in, from verse 30 onwards. And that really sort of sums up the final words of Paul from his own uh, life to this particular church. What an amazing man Paul is, or was, wasn't he? In these words that we have here, in these personal words. 
And it is good that we just, as, as introduction, reflect upon how amazing this ministry of the Apostle Paul was, as he, as he describes himself here to the church of Rome, to this church that he's never met. And he tells them some things about himself and what's happening in his ministry to this church. You might have heard him, but here he tells us. So we're going to spend a little bit of time thinking about this great ministry of the Apostle Paul as he's about 50, maybe about 55 years of age. And we can see at this time he's now not busy preparing for the end. He's got great plans for the future of his life. And he's telling them some of these plans uh, that he's going to be uh, anticipating for the next time. Or, or the next season of his life. But he tells the church here about himself that he is the prime minister, apostle of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And makes some quite astounding statements of himself. You see, he says Jesus Christ here, verse 19, that he is a minister of Christ <coughs> Jesus. Paul saw himself not just as a pastor of a church, he wasn't a pastor of a church, but he was the prime minister, as it were, the minister from the Lord and the primary one to all the non-believing nations. This is a unique ministry that the Apostle Paul has and continues to all the nations through the letters that he has written. And this is what Jesus Christ made him, this great Apostle to the Gentiles. And we should always, as, as churches, we should always think of the Apostle Paul as the, our Apostle. Peter, James and John, the others, they were given to the Jews, but the Gentiles... Who's their great apostle? Who's the prime minister? The ministering the gospel. It's Paul, the apostle Paul. And so his words for us are very dear and precious because he laid the foundation for what we are enjoying today and building upon in the Gentile world. That was the apostle Paul. And we should look to him just as Jews look to Moses. And thank God for Moses who sort of initiated the old covenant. We should look to Paul as the one who is the one who's laying the foundation of the gospel into the Gentile world in a, in a totally unique manner. This is the Apostle Paul's ministry to the Gentiles and the reason why he's writing Romans to a church that he's never met. Because they're a Gentile church and he is the Apostle to the Gentiles. So, he, he is a very important person and uh, he had a he had a large scope to his parish. He was never out of work. As John Wesley said, the world is my parish. This is what Paul says. The Gentiles, wherever they are, that's my parish where I must minister the gospel of God. And he says here, I see myself as a priest, priest among the Gentiles. And what I'm doing, I'm going in amongst the Gentiles as a priest, bringing in a great harvest amongst all these Gentile nations, preaching the gospel of mercy, the gospel of the cross, and making a harvest in all these Gentile cities, and bringing them up to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. This is the Apostle Paul's great ministry that he explains here, his crucial and strategic ministry amongst the Gentiles in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to this morning look at these words of Paul and to think about for ourselves what we can learn and see here from Paul's ministry about this important task of working for Christ, of working for Christ and serving Christ. So I want to look at Paul as an as a illustration for us of how we can serve Christ. And this should be a very important question for all of us. There's one thing we do know we saved, if you remember the Salvation Army, uh, for those of you, of you who work from the Salvation Army, uh, the, the logo of you saved to serve. That's why you saved, saved to serve. 
And uh, it's a very important question, how we can serve the Lord, uh, that we are saved and, other, and there are some important things that the Apostle Paul can teach us. Let's, as a preliminary sort of point about that, let's look at these first few verses in verse 14. Paul writes to the church and said, I am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness and filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you more bold, very boldly by way of reminder. It's quite startling how highly Paul thinks of what's happening in the church of Rome. He was an apostle to the nations. He obviously kept in touch with what's happening at churches even far away. And Paul had never been to Rome and is wanting to go to Rome. He's on his way, but the letter reaches first before he does. But he hears good things about this church. And he is, the report is something that he is convinced of. Because when you just hear things, you don't believe them until you've investigated and become convinced of them. That's an important principle for our, our uh, media-driven world today. He hears these reports and he is glad at the work of Christ in this church and thankful to them and, and actually says something quite startling. I've written, verse 15, I've written this great letter of Romans to just remind you of things. I mean... It's quite something that you think of Romans just as a reminder. But that's how Paul says. He says, these are stuff that you know, and I'm writing you Romans to remind you of these things. How we often need to be reminded, even though we can be uh, filled with all knowledge. And Paul writes to bring them, these things, to a remembrance to their minds. Now, as we think of serving Christ, this... These few verses speak to me of the fact that Christian service and Christian ministry is not ultimate, but Christ is in the church. This church, without an apostle, we don't know who planted the church of Rome. Some people do think that an apostle had to be there. There's no real evidence we don't know who planted this church, probably without an apostle. How can they be doing so well without apostolic ministry and without the ministry of Paul to the Gentiles? He hasn't been there, but this church in Rome, the central church, is doing so well. It's flourishing. And this is just an important thing as we consider Christian service and Christian ministry that any Christian service, any Christian ministry is not ultimately dependent upon a human being. It's not dependent upon us. It's ultimately dependent upon Christ. And Paul recognized the sufficiency of Christ for this local church of Rome. Jesus was there. And Jesus was filling these people with goodness and with knowledge and they were able to instruct one another because of the spirit of God that was in this church and because of the sufficiency of Christ this is an important thing local churches do not need international external ministries or Jesus Christ is sufficient for his church to keep them and to nurture them and to grow them in the things of the Lord. So much so that you don't need counselors, an external thing. You've got the resources amongst yourself in the Lord to actually counsel one another because of the sufficiency of Christ. And Paul realized that. I don't know if you've ever read a book called Competent to Counsel by J. Adams. It was quite a popular book. I've got it at home and I've never read it. <laughs> but that I've got it there means I would like to read it I was very interested though and it was popular a few decades ago uh, he used this text for his theme for the book competent to counsel 
And he said, he looked at this, the church, you are able to counsel one another. And that type of counseling is called nuthetic counseling, because the Greek word is nutheteo, which means to teach and to put truth to one another and help one another. And uh, so the, the local church, through the sufficiency and presence of Jesus, is, is quite startling in the light of all that Paul says here. And he says, my whole letter of Rome, you don't actually need it. You know those things. I'm just here to remind you of these things. And how often do we do need reminders? And that's why the Lord blesses us with other ministries. Now, the three things mainly about how to work for Christ, let me just say as, as we go into them. Firstly, Paul makes it very, very clear here in verse uh, 15, going on to 16, that f firstly, Christian service, working for Christ, is all about the grace of Jesus Christ. As I've written to you, remind you, because of the grace given me by God to be a minister. <coughs> Paul understands <coughs> Christian service and ministry that he's exemplifying here as something which is only by the grace of God at work in his life. And this is quite startling. From start to finish, it is the grace of the Lord at work in the life of Paul and in the life of anybody who seeks to serve the Lord. One of the most basic principles is needing to know it's all about the grace of God at work in your life. That is the starting place. For Christian ministry. There is no place for boasting, no place for pride, no place for being about yourself or being about something that you want for your own name and honor. Any ministry is exemplified in our great apostle is only by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these words show that Paul never boasted. He's writing to the church and he says, yes, I have some profound things to say. And you might feel I'm coming on a little bit strong and sort of uh, uh, upping things a bit here. But I want you to know, I'm not saying these things, says Paul, because I just want to say them. And I'm saying these things because God has made, given me grace to be a minister. That's why I'm saying these things to you. He never boasted in himself because he realized it's the grace of the Lord. How easy it is. And when we think of Christian service, and particularly people, people I think of in church history, or people that we uh, honor in the church, and we think, wow, they are something different. It's, they have done marvelously. They are really sort of a cut above the rest, and we so easily exalt people that are impressionable and have done great things for the Lord. Paul says, I want you to know that I, who I am is only by the grace of Christ. This was Paul's testimony to himself. If you want to quickly look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, just the next chapter, Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, 9, 9 and 10, he says, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And the grace, His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but it was the grace of God that was in me. That's Paul's testimony to his life. From the beginning of my life and ministry to the end of my life and ministry, it's not I, but the grace of Christ that is powerfully working within me. And I worked more than the others, he says. But not I. The grace of Christ in me. This was the Apostle Paul's life. Jesus in operation that made Paul take no credit for himself in the work that he was doing. And we've got to realize this. And this is why sometimes for people to go into more full-time Christian ministry, it takes a while for them to 
effectively go into that. Because we can be so overconfident about the things we're going to do for the Lord. And see the need and feel the need and feel that we've got resources to do this and that. And preparation for Christian ministry is always to bring the servants of the Lord to the end of themselves. And to be able to truly say, this is not I, but the grace of God within me. That's doing this. It's God's powerful, unmerited favor at operation. Those, that's how Christian ministry is. Not because of the merits of worthiness, but because of the grace of Christ. So, it's all about the grace of the Lord from the beginning to the end. The next and the central point, certainly for what I want to emphasize, and I think Paul is emphasizing that here, is the reminder this morning that Christian service is Christ at work in His people. Christian service is Christ at work in His people. If we go to the next slide, look what it says there in verse 15. Paul says, I, I won't even speak of anything except what Christ has effectively accomplished through me to bring about the Gentile, to, to bring to the Gentiles this obedience by word and by deed, by the power of signs and wonders, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. These words, Paul is basically saying, all that I've done, and I'm at a phase now when I'm in this arc of preaching the gospel from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, you know where Jerusalem is, if you know where Croatia is and Bosnia Herzegovina is in the Adriatic Sea. That's our Paul says, I have effect I have laid foundations in strategic churches, in strategic regions rather. And so I see my work there is complete. And now I want to go on. And I've been ministering there in word and deed, powerfully, people have been converted, turned to God and turned to Christ. And how does Paul understand that? He says, I'll tell you about what Christ has done through me. Christ has done all those deeds through Paul. And he wants this church to know this. And this is a very important lesson to understand for Christian ministry in serving the Lord is that effective ministry is about the ministry of Christ not our work but his work Paul was a host to Christ Paul was an instrument through Christ working powerfully in his powerful agency through Paul and this is what made effective Christian ministry Paul's whole life, wasn't it, if you know a little bit about Paul? His whole life was Christ in me. That was the secret of the Apostle Paul. And you could ask him, you want to interview with him. If you like interviews on the, about Christian leaders, some people and always wanted to know, you know, what makes a really good minister? Or if they could take an important, take a... Uh, a Piper or a John MacArthur or somebody and say, now, you know, tell me what the secret was of your ministry. Oh, and we could spend some time there. You know, the Apostle Paul would be very short. We're rather disappointing for viewers. Paul, what's the secret? And what Paul's secret is, he put it so well in Galatians 2.20. <coughs> he said, here it is. I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live. But the life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. It's Christ who's living in me. It's no longer about me. What you see is His powerful activity. That's it. End of interview. That's Paul's testimony. Christian ministry is Christ's ministry. In the lives of His people. And he says, everything I've done. It's Christ has accomplished, a very strong word, effectively accomplished through me these things. 
We know the picture. Many of us, John 15, remember? How can you bear much fruit? Abide in me, and I abide in you. It's that relationship of the indwelling Christ. That's what Christian ministry is about. The presence of Jesus. It's what Jesus, how Jesus ministered. If you look at Jesus' ministry, He said to the disciples about believing who He is, He said, well, if you don't believe my words, believe the works that I'm doing, because the, the works are the Father's presence indwelling. Even Jesus, it was the indwelling Father within Jesus, that was the ministry of Jesus. That's what He says in John chapter... I wrote this down here somewhere. John chapter 10 verse 16. It's the Father in me doing His work. That is the ministry of Jesus. So when we think of Jesus, we think, wow, once again, here's a, the, this man, the Son of God, and He's doing just this powerful ministry, what He's doing, Jesus said, oh, hang on a second, it's not just about what I'm doing, it's what the Father's doing in me, and through me, that's what the important thing is. And Paul is saying exactly the same thing about what true Christian ministry is. So if we serve in Christ, save to serve, we want to serve the Lord. We've got to learn this lesson. And this lesson is, is really about Christ's servants. Are the people who, it's not all about doing things for the Lord. It's doing things from the Lord in our lives. And it's a world of difference between those two things. Doing things from the Lord's indwelling presence. And it is His mighty work. This is what service in the kingdom of God is about. What it means to be a servant. And we've got to relearn everything. We've got to really relearn so much about what's, what Christian service is. And how to live as a Christian. Well, when we say you've got to relearn everything. Because that's what... Becoming a Christian is about. Becoming a Christian is about that you've got to repent in your mind, in your behavior. Everything you know, all that you've done has been wrong. You need to acknowledge that. And you need to learn to do things differently. And it also is how we do service. And what Paul is teaching us here, it's not I, it's Christ mightily working within me. And receiving His grace is so, so important for knowing the powerful work of Christ within us. There is a wonderful psalm that I want to just mention, Psalm 123, which brings this out so well, before we go on to the next point. And the psalm says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my eyes, you who are enthroned in the heavens, Behold, as the eyes of the servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of the maidservant to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, till He has had mercy on us. Have mercy or kindness upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us. You might not see this yet, saying exactly the same thing. We look, the psalmist is looking up to the eye, looking up to the Lord, and just like a servant or a slave looks up to the master, looking to the hand of the master or the hand of the mistress as the maid servant. You would expect, wouldn't you, in this posture, that the next line is going to be saying, these servants are looking to the hand of the master because we're looking for that hand to tell us what to do. The maiden is looking to the hand of the mistress so that he can wait to receive instructions, to do something, to serve. The psalm doesn't say that. The posture is a posture waiting to receive something from the master or from the mistress. Because that's how servants of God have always been and 
are always to be. It's to receive grace from the Master. Not firstly to do something for the Master, for the mistress, but to receive mercy and help and grace. And this is what Paul is exemplifying in his life. What the nations need, and as he is a servant, they need Christ, not himself. They need the anointed of God, the hope of the nations, the root of Jesse that he just spoken about. They need Christ. And he, in his ministry, was Christ reaching out to the Gentiles. So, that's encouraging. That it is Christ's work where the center of gravity is in his workers. And lastly, I think from the Apostle Paul, we can learn here the fact that Christ works this grace differently in each individual. In the last section here, Paul says, verse 20, he makes it his ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been preached, lest, somebody build, lest I build upon somebody else's foundation, but he goes to where Jesus has never been named. Paul was a pioneer par excellence, wasn't he? He'd be tired. He wouldn't stay long here in this area. <laughs> because his passion was to take this message to where people have never heard about Jesus, or at least not adequately, or heard. He, this is very, very clear. He was a pioneer church planter. And so he's telling the church he's leaving this area. Now there's a relative witness there. He's going to Spain, hopes to go to Spain because there Christ has never been heard. And this was his passion, to preach the gospel to people who've never heard about the crucified king. And to take that. And he says, this is I, verse 20, I make it my ambition. There's something, there's a great passion involved in Paul here. That's why he can never settle, why he's always, his eyes are on the horizon, because this is a passion of his. The fact is, not everybody has that passion, do they? Not everybody in the church of Paul's day, not everybody in Rome felt the same. Not every Christian leader felt Paul's passion, and made this a mastering ambition of his life. If you could settle Paul down and say, Paul, what do you really want to do for the Lord? What's on your heart? What's your passion to do? Paul would say, well, this is exactly the same. I want to preach Christ where he hasn't been preached before and lay a foundation. That's my passion. Now, I want to apply this to ourselves. And uh, this is what we have dealt with a bit when it comes to different gifts and different forms of service. And this is that... In serving for Christ, we need to know that there are different graces from the Lord for each different person. And in wanting to find out what is your, how can you serve the Lord, and how can you do it in the light of what we said about it's Christ's work in you, how can we get in tune with that? How can we flow with that? Well, it comes to be what is your passion? What is your ambition? What do you want to do for the Lord? Not what you have to do or feel, but what do you want to do? This has been very important for me over the years, and it remains. What's at the bottom of my heart? Of what, if, if you had to say to me, what, Paul, what do you want to do? That you could do anything. What do you, what's the one thing you want to do? I, have, I would answer you in the light of some things on my heart to do. I wouldn't be doing everything, but there would be something that's on my heart. And this is how we get in tune with the unique work of Christ in each one of us. Paul was like that. It's by, where's your passion for the Lord? In your best spiritual frames, when you're in prayer, when you, when you just are loving the Lord and in His presence, and then you think of, oh, 
is, this is what I want to do for you. You're coming close to know what the Lord's grace, particularly in your life, is. We mustn't be copies. And Paul was very emphatic about this to the church. And we looked at this in Romans 12, verse 3. He practiced what he preached. Romans 12, 3 says, For the, by the grace given to me, I say to you, to everyone among you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. But think of yourself with sober judgment, because God has given a measure of faith or grace to each one. But Paul would never oppose this upon people. Hey, you've got to go now. Be out there and be in the pioneering horizons. Everybody should be doing that because it's quite easy when that is your passion and gift. You think everybody should be doing that because you know it's not of yourself. It's Christ. And you, so it's just trust the Lord and He'll do it. Paul wasn't like that. He actually said, don't think of yourself too highly. But think of yourself in accordance with the grace that God has given. And so, what an example Paul is in his own life and his works. In the knowing the, the differences in avenues of service as they are displayed in his life. So in conclusion, everything that Paul says here in these verses wasn't his idea. His life from beginning to end was the life of Christ in him. <coughs> By the grace of God, he said, I am who I am. Paul, for us, shows a way of Christian ministry that is Christ-glorifying in its power, in its effectiveness, in its strategy, in everything. It's about the glory and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in His people. That's was essential for Paul. It is, we could call it, the miracle of Christian ministry because it takes Christ's indwelling presence in His people. Paul knew the truth of what Isaiah 26 verse 12 says, Lord, You will ordain peace for us, says the prophet, and indeed all that we have done, You have done for us. This glorifies Christ. So, as His servants, what do we do? If it's all about Christ now, then, okay, well, we just sit and wait. Well, yes. It is, firstly, about taking up the posture of the servant before the Master. And it is, as the Psalm 123 said, looking to the hand of the Lord to help you, to give you grace, and inspiration, and direction, power. It is firstly about being before the Lord in sincerity and truth, presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, as Romans 12 verse 1. It is, Christian ministry is firstly about making room in our lives for the life of Christ to do its work, to work powerfully within us. It's realizing these things. It starts off by realizing these truths and then living on the basis. And let me just remind myself and yourself, anything can happen. <laughs> really. If it's about Christ in you, the hope of glory, if it's about the anointed of the Lord in the fullness of His power dwelling in His people, let's not think, okay, well, if we do this, we're just going to, everything's going to be the same. It's not like that. We can expect that what He works within us and what we work out are what we cannot ask or think or imagine of all that He will do according to the power of work within us. It's a, a glorious thing, the ministry of Jesus Christ. And expectation and faith are really the only ways to flow with the Lord because it's His glorious work and not ours. So, 
Let's lift up our faith. Open ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we've got to just stop doing many things or we've just got to and we've just got to be in the, in the faith and humility and expectation before our Savior and expect His presence to work within us so that it's all about Him. What He has accomplished through me, said Paul. And those are the things that I speak about. Would you present your life to the Lord that He can do wonderful things through you? It's come to Him. Lord, it is good to exalt the sovereignty of Christ again in every department with our brother and our Apostle Paul. We thank you for his testimony in Romans and in Corinthians. We thank you that he so well pointed to the living Christ and said, it's not I but Christ in me doing his works. And oh Lord, that is our hope today. That's our hope for the country we've been praying about. It's our hope for our lives and our families. It's our hope for our neighborhoods. Not I, but Christ. So come, Lord, take these words in us that I've been speaking about and glorify yourself. Lord, put forth your hand and your power and your grace. Thank you for the grace of the Lord. Thank you that it's not about our merits or our, on our past performances. You do not use us on that basis. Thank you that it is through faith alone in the grace of God. And we want to just, in those last few moments, as Paul said, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. To say like Isaiah said, here am I, Lord. Here am I. Have your way in me and through me. And do your great deeds to the glory of your name.